So we're here today with Stephen Smugin um, from Red Hat, who was a speaker at the CentOS Dojo at the Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratories today. Um, Steve, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Thank you very much for your time. Tell us a little bit about what you spoke about today. So today I gave a sort of top-level view of how to use software stacks in uh, open source of software stacks in a secure manner that will work for um, long-term research projects. A lot of research projects live for much longer than the researcher realizes um, and sometimes will have to be re resuscitated years after the first time it had been done. I worked on a satellite project that was only supposed to be three years, run for three years and ended up running for almost 20 and the code that was written for that three-year thing had to constantly be redeployed in newer and newer hardware cycles. There are a lot of things that our current infrastructure uh, have problems with because they, they expect you to be always on the network and always with the latest code, and that doesn't work well when you have a research project that you need to uh, replicate what you did 10 years later, maybe 20 years later, or uh, and have somebody else replicated. Um, if, they, if they just do a get pull of certain software, they're gonna end up with different, different values and different stuff. And it isn't really thought well out, and there's not a lot of tools that people use in the things because most of the built-in stacks assume, well, you don't, really care about the old stuff. You can go back to it if you want, but maybe. But, you know, the latest is always the greatest. And so what I looked at was, I looked at a bunch of them and then I realized that I needed to go with something that was fairly well and would work with the OS. And that, so I tied the talk with RPMs and how RPMs can be used to, uh, and RPMs are the Red Hat package management system that uh, Fedora and CentOS and Red Hat and OpenSUSE all use. As you talk about this this topic and and the concepts behind it, I'm assuming that this is all because this is all open source software. That the 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 methodology that you use to approach this uh, problem is a lot easier. Yes, it is uh, because the fact is is that uh, the things that you want to look for are. You want to be able to track changes. So in some ways, what you're ha I mean, a lot of people just assume that you can stick everything in GitHub and get it out and it always, but if somebody rewrites the uh, repository's history or if they did download the stuff, delete the project and re-upload the project again, it looks like it's the same project with completely different uh, trails. You really need to have some sort of way of replicating your own replicating the repositories locally and tracing how you built the project, how you uh, manipulated the data within the flows of the project, and having some sort of trust mechanism so that when you come back to it 5, 10, 20 years later, that uh, code is still valid. Mm -hmm. And to elaborate on what you, you something you said a little bit earlier is is a lot of the 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 magic in this, so to speak, relying on the RPM package manager tool, or are there other open source tools that there you're are many other with? sources. I, I just chose RPM because it comes with the operating system, mm -hmm. and okay. I could show in my head how to do things. There are other ways you could do this with any of the tools, uh, most of the tools. It's just, it's more of a process, and the process, uh, having the process, knowing the process, and implementing and following through on it. Uh, RPM, RPM, because it's been around for 20 years, has a lot of this built into it, and from either the school of hard knocks already, or the, uh, when RPM was first designed, the whole idea was, well, how can you trust something that you got from somebody else? How... How do you know this package hasn't changed? How do you know what it changed on the system? Can you see what this package owns and what it touched and what it didn't touch? And how do you establish a 
sort of a, a, a frenzy, trust chain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, a lot of the software tools, when the, the package managers for various the Python stack, or the Rust stack, or the Google Golang stack, all of them, they're usually, the, the first problem the developer's thinking about is how do I get my software to you? And how do you build it? And how do you deploy it? And those are important things to do, but they don't answer the other questions that need to be answered. And those are the ones that they end, end up having to go back and rapidly put back through because somebody's had a security incident due to, and couldn't prove that they had a security incident. Or they thought they proved that they didn't, and they did. One of the questions I've been asking everybody as a final question, as you know, yesterday was the birthday for CentOS. So I've been asking uh, all of our interview uh, interviewees, when when was your first uh, time with CentOS? So I actually started with CentOS shortly after it was formed. Uh, I was actually working with white box Linux. Oh, yeah and some other ones because I was working at Los Alamos National Lab and we had Red Hat, we were mostly deploying Red Hat Linux uh, 7.3 and there was a big fight over whether or not to go to uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux because they were worried that the bits were closed and all this other stuff. So we instead actually deployed white box Linux because we could trust that we had all been compiled that way. And white box Linux had a short lifetime and there's been papers about that, so I don't want to uh, go into it. But uh, eventually the, one of the people came to it and started doing CentOS. And I started on CentOS uh, with CentOS 4 and 3. I was deploying that at Sandia National Labs and five Red Hat Linux, Enterprise Linux 5 is just coming out and, I had done a whole bunch of QA work for Red Hat Linux in the old days. I wasn't one of key QA ever, but I do, and I said, oh, I'll help do the CentOS stuff. Sure. So uh, they had me in on CentOS, and for CentOS 5, I did, I did a good portion of the QA work on getting it ready and testing. At that time, we were going for something what we, we, uh, we called bug for bug compatibility with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5. We didn't fix anything that was already broken in five, but we wanted to have it, you know, we, we could re replicate a bug so that, and over the years, you know, they have a bit of hubris there. Um, there are things you couldn't do and there's things you can do, but I've worked with them since then. I, uh, even though I work primarily for Fedora, all my laptops and desktops are CentOS systems. Um, I, Worked with CentOS before they got, I merged in with Red Hat team and the open source standards team mm -hmm. and was in part, helped out with that merging a bit. And I just finished a project with the CentOS team of mer working on merging the Fedora source code uh, repositories and the CentOS repositories so that it'll make it so much easier so that when you have, uh, say, for CentOS 8 or CentOS 9, and you have Fedora 37, you can just pull what we've got in 37 over and compare it to CentOS 9 stuff and see what's where things are. And if you're doing stuff like what my main, my main other work is with extra packages, Apple is extra packages for enterprise Linux. I compile a whole bunch of stuff that's in Fedora for uh, RHEL and CentOS, and so it's easier if I can compare the two source trees as they mm -hmm. do stuff, and then I know I'm not compiling this because I don't replace packages either in CentOS or in uh, RHEL. Right. So uh, I've been working with them pretty much, I would say 12, maybe 13 of their 15 years. Wow. Well, thank you for uh, coming in and sharing with us today. And thank you again for your time, for having me.